and welcome to Cats Week. I'm Annalise Poorman. On January 19th, the Bloomington City Council voted on an ordinance establishing an expanded outdoor dining area downtown. During public comment, owner of the Village Deli and Soma Coffee House, Bob Costello, spoke on behalf of the Kirkwood Community Association in support of the outdoor dining ordinance. We have worked um, diligently with the city, with both Jane Cooper Smith and Michael and Adam to um, thrive and survive uh, during what's been a very trying time. And I do want to make sure people keep in context that most of the restaurants on Kirkwood and some of the retail would not be open today had we not had the opportunity to have outdoor seating. Um, if we touch base with some of the retail operators, <clears throat> you'll find that some of them had the best year they have ever had um, while the street was closed and people were <clears throat> out and about shopping and walking and conversing and visiting with each other. <clears throat> so I just want to stress the importance of our economic survival and that economic survival also helped the city because you continued to collect tax revenue um, from our businesses. And uh, as someone mentioned earlier, the importance of the service industry to the Bloomington community <clears throat> culturally as well as financially. So I'd just like to sum up to say that I think it's extremely important that we continue this. Um, and I'm actually an advocate and I'm speaking personally now, not for the Kirkwood Community Association, but I'm an advocate for closing Kirkwood completely and uh, only having it, uh, having, only having pedestrian traffic allowed, but that's another meeting, hopefully. Council member Steve Volan explained that the metered parking on Kirkwood Avenue brings in substantial revenue for the city of Bloomington and advocated for one lane to remain open. He recommended Jersey blocks to ensure the other lane would be safe for pedestrians. Director of Public Works Adam Wason said that installing the Jersey barriers would use up a significant portion of the city's barrier inventory and that he was in favor of us using bollards instead. Councilmember Ron Smith shared that he ran a shoe store on Kirkwood and understands why the road would be better as a pedestrian mall. Last Thursday, I was a, a guest at the Kirkwood uh, Merchants Association, also with uh, DBI was there with uh, Ms. Kopic and uh, Mr. Hayes, and listened to a really good discussion on um, closing Kirkwood. And it was overwhelmingly supported um by uh by the all the folks um you know that were there and and spoke out and it made me feel real good that uh you know we, we uh helped to play a part in it um kirkwood's just a vital uh link it's a vital artery to lifeblood of downtown bloomington uh, i was a merchant on uh, kirkwood where kilroy's is I ran a shoe store there for seven years when I got out of college. And believe me, it's it's really the lifeblood and it, you know, it ser serves this artery from the university downtown and downtown back to the university. It's, uh, it's just really important that we do everything we can to help all the businesses and, and the restaurateurs. So um, I'm gonna be supporting it and, um, I think that it's a really good discussion to have that maybe we need to make it a pedestrian mall down, down the road. The ordinance passed unanimously. The council also continued their discussion on whether or not to reduce the number of standing committees. Council member Matt Flaherty introduced an amendment that would ensure the Climate Action and Resilience Standing Committee remains due to its ongoing work that he said the Committee of the Whole does not have enough time to dedicate to considering our climate emergency. The ordinance to dissolve the administration, community affairs, housing, public safety, sustainable development, and land use committees passed with a 5-4 to four vote. The amendment to retain the Climate Action and Resilience Standing Committee passed 9-0. At the Monroe County Public Library Board of Trustees meeting on January 19th, Director Marilyn Wood announced two events that are coming up. 
I'd like to talk about two important events that are coming up in February. Um, the uh, Friends have two events, one being the Power of Words, which is subtitled Changing Our World, One Author at a Time. It's a biennial author event, and this year uh, we're very happy to present uh, Jacqueline Woodson, who is an internationally acclaimed and award-winning author of more than 30 books, and she will be giving a talk at the Buzzkirk Chumley at 7 p.m. on February 5th, and that uh, that talk is free to the public. Um, she will, her works have focused on African American society, gender, and she places boundaries in her books, social, economic, physical, sexual, racial, then has her characters break through both the physical and psychological boundaries to create a strong and emotional story. Among her numerous awards, uh, she received the 2014 National Book Award for Young People's Literature for Brown Girl Dreaming. She's a three-time winner of the Coretta Scott King Book Award in 2001, 15, and 21. And she was also named a MacArthur Fellow in 2020. Uh, the Power of Words uh, is held in conjunction with a special exhibit that the Friends of the Library is hosting. It will be here in these rooms for seven weeks, uh, beginning on February 1st. It's a traveling exhibit from the National Center for Children's Illustrated Literature and it's called Our Voice, celebrating the Coretta Scott King Illustrator Awards. Those awards are uh, an annual event uh, that are awarded by the American Library Association for books by black illustrators. And Coretta Scott King Book Awards emphasize the importance of children's literature on America's cultural landscape. The exhibit and Power Awards programs will be part of our city's celebration of Black History Month. Associate Director Greer Carson gave an update on the ongoing construction at the library's New Southwest branch. So there's a giant hole in the ground near Bachelor Middle School right now. If you haven't taken the time to drive out there and look, you certainly should. It's, it's tremendous progress. The excavation of the basement and the drive entrance is now complete. We did hit some small amount of limestone requiring rock removal. That's been completed. We don't know yet if we've gone over our allowance for the rock removal, so Strasser is itemizing that for us. They've installed the building pad in the basement area, currently laying stones for drives and have begun excavation for foundations and continue the miscellaneous grading around the retention areas. We're setting up a documentation camera for a time-lapse video of construction from start to finish and working with a third-party earth cam to provide the service, so that's gonna be really cool. There's one item for the exterior of the building that's still under review and we're looking at a choice between two products before making a decision. We're planning to place orders for equipment for the kitchen, the automatic sorter, and other technology very soon. We'll also soon begin planning for and ordering our Southwest Branch collection. And finally, we expect to see the actual foundation go up in the coming weeks. The next Board of Trustees meeting will be held on February 16th. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. I'm at risk of thinking there's just no point in trying. I'm at risk of looking in the mirror and hating what I see. I'm at risk of being told not to tell. But with Girls Inc. in my corner, I will not be another statistic. I will fight for myself. With you in my corner, I will win. Fuel her fire and she will change the world. Girls, Inc. Welcome back to Cats Week. At the Monroe County Commissioner's meeting on January 19th, County Attorney Jeff Cockerell gave background information on a program between the Richland Bean Blossom School Corporation and the Redevelopment Commission, which funds STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math programming. State code allows for the redevelopment commission to enter an agreement with someone who's developing uh, the workforce to give a up to a certain percentage of the revenue towards that programming um, the redevelopment commission started this uh, project with the richland bean blossom community school corporation because that is the school corporation that's in that covers the west side uh, tiff which is our revenue generating tiff district um, started that probably five, six years ago that we actually renewed that contract last year to help them uh, do additional um, 
uh, staff training and, and additional programming. Uh, I would invite the public if they want to know more about it. I think at the February Redevelopment Commission, we'll get our semi-annual report from the Richland Bean Blossom School Corporation to see what they're doing and, and how they're utilizing that money. But the history of it has been very exciting and has done a lot of, of good things for that school. Commissioner Lee Jones said that the Redevelopment Commission is not obligated to sponsor the programming and applauded the use of the funds. What the RDC has been doing, it really is wonderful. Um, TIFs can be very useful to a community in a lot of ways, but they do kind of sap off some of the money that would go to schools. And by doing this, the RDC, it's nothing that they have to do it, do. They're doing it to help the schools out. And uh, that's something very commendable. The commissioners also approved an addendum to the Monroe County Co-op Plan titled Vaccine and 15 Testing Requirement Policy per OSHA Standard. Cockrell shared changes to Occupational Safety and Health Act standards. The update is that the Supreme Court last Thursday uh, reinstituted the stay on the enforce of the enforceability of those uh, temporary emergency standards by OSHA. These are the standards that require uh, vaccination or a weekly testing um, of employees. Um, our policy was put in place with with the understanding that those those requirements were going to be met, and there were serious uh, financial consequences if if we did not meet those. And so, I thought that since it's no longer enforceable, we probably should have a discussion on whether we wanted to keep. Uh, those in place right now, or if we wanted to wait until it worked its way through the courts, I included in the packet a amendment to that if you chose that would only make those enforceable upon uh, the enforceability of OSHA of those temporary emergency standards. Um, so if you have any questions, I, I think that's kind of a big change from when we enacted that policy. So I think a, a review of that's necessary and advice. The addendum was approved unanimously. On January 18th, the Bloomington Utilities Service Board approved a Memorandum of Understanding with City Engineering for Citywide Bridge and Structure Inspections for $18,000. Utilities Engineer Phil Peden explained what the inspections consist of. They actually go in by manually. They go in, these are all large enough they can walk in. And so they'll check the, the structure for any uh, degradation in the concrete or re exposed rebar, or if the metal is starting to rust, uh, they look for any deficiencies. They note those on the inlet and outlet side, and then, and then the portion that's under the pavement, uh, just looking for any deficiencies that might lead to a failure. He said that they have been doing these inspections since 2019 and have not discovered significant damage. He said it helps to have a baseline awareness of the state of the bridges to monitor their condition over the years. Later in the meeting, Director of Utilities Vic Kelson announced that board members need to be appointed to the Neighborhood Stormwater Grant Program Board since the review process will begin soon. Board member Megan Parmenter asked how soon it would be and for more details about the review process. Assistant Director of Environmental Programs James Hall responded saying that the grants will be due on the 1st of February. The first of February is when the applications are due. And then we'll have an internal review, which consists of Phil and our MS4 committee. And then they kind of give them a ranking or, you know, um, how well they think they'll suit our system. And then they pass it on to the review board. Um, that's usually about a month. The internal review, four to six weeks is how long that typically takes. The next utility service board meeting will be held on January 31st. And we'll have more Cats Week after this message. For hurting families in Monroe County. A contribution to, to children who are vulnerable and in need of an advocate. A staff that goes above and beyond to support and advocate for children in need of services. The web of remarkable people who are dealing with difficult situations. So many young people that uh, are in need of help and try and find a stable family, a stable place to live. 
without uh, the CASAs to, to make that happen, many of them would be unable to find a good home. I love being that voice for the child who can't speak for themselves in court. It takes me out of my comfort zone, and it also helps others. CASA means supporting our community. Being a CASA is making sure that your village is healthy and whole, and that the children in your village will someday be able to help the village as well. A child who doesn't have a voice, maybe in their family situation or a school situation, now has a voice that can advocate for them. I really enjoy working with children that are going through difficult times and letting them know that I care about their future. We are privileged with our charge of representing the best interest of children. And so therefore, we can advocate for exactly what they need without restriction, focusing on their best interest. I want to repair the world one child at a time. Welcome back to Cats Week. On January 18th, at the Bloomington Board of Public Works meeting, board member Kyla Cox Deckard was appointed as president of the board, with Beth Hollingsworth as vice president and Elizabeth Carone as secretary. During public comment, construction manager Shannon Simpson expressed concern at how the city has handled bids and lump sum contracts. He says the agreements have cost him money due to extenuating circumstances not considered in the contracts. From my perspective, it makes the Bloomington not an attractive place to want to work. Uh, being in my backyard, that's bad for me. Um, you know, I think we've, uh, the four jobs, I tried to figure out exactly what savings I've brought the city. You know, I think collectively my bids have been in excess of a hundred thousand plus dollars hundred and as much as hundred and fifty thousand dollars below the next bidder you know on those four collective projects um you know we 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 took it on the chin on our, our mitchell street project uh we signed a contract that that the contract plainly stated it was a lump sum job and we got paid unit prices and uh cost us about fifteen thousand dollars i don't remember the exact amount um, you know, we uh, worked on the uh, uh, Sarah Road uh, uh, tree clearing. Uh, there was an error in the plans there. And we worked with the uh, uh, city engineer at the time, Craig, and I can't think of Craig's last name, uh, to find a, a way to work through and get the job done so that the uh, time was of the essence. We, uh, the, the trail could get built and you know, uh, felt like we really uh, got the short end of the stick again on that. But, you know, and I got Craig's, I'll owe you one. And, uh, you know, before he left, he did call me and he says, boy, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, you're, you're going to get left hanging on that. Simpson said it is important to him that the city has a welcoming work environment. You've got to put your best as a city, I think, you've got to put your best foot forward to attract these, uh, you know, every contractor you can to get good prices for your work. Um, and and it, it just doesn't, I, I get operating within contracts and operating within specs. I understand it. I do it all the time. But there's, there's also, uh, you know, a general overtone that I, it feels like I'm trying to, the, the city's trying to get one over on me all the time. Director of Public Works Adam Wason responded, saying that city staff will respond to his letter and has considered all of the information Simpson submitted. I will just take a moment to um, give a brief response from city staff and um, just uh, let Mr. Simpson know that we absolutely do try to create that environment and it's um, um, something we don't necessarily have. Um, we don't have a lot of projects that have issues. Um, and what I would just suggest, Mr. Simpson, if you have a claim for, and I know Mr. Seaborn and you have been in uh, contact a lot, uh, Mr. Simpson, and I know, um, you know, Andrew let you know he wasn't going to be able to be at this meeting tonight, um, had asked that we postpone two weeks to the next meeting, but if there are valid claims for the project, they need to be submitted, um, and that, that's something Andrew will definitely reiterate to you. Um, we will, again, go line, you know, item by item in, in the letter that was sent and uh, provide explanation of how we arrived, how, how staff arrived to where they um, 
came on the project. The next Board of Public Works meeting will be held on February 1st. On January 14th, at the COVID-19 press conference, Monroe County Health Administrator Penny Cottle said that Monroe County has moved to the red advisory category on the state's color-coded map. Cottle also provided a breakdown of the latest COVID-19 numbers. I will start with news I don't think is new to anybody, and that's that the county advisory is red this week. Our current rolling daily average is rising every day. It's now over 300 per day, the highest number that we've seen so far. This week, we topped 1,000 cases per 100,000 residents and a positivity rate over 19%. Uh, with this amount of transmission, testing sites are understandably overwhelmed. Uh, turnaround time is increasing for those test results. So again, patience um, is desperately needed, even though it is a very frustrating time if you're looking for testing or waiting for your results. In terms of the Indiana Department of Health and Gravity testing site, they have put in efficiencies. It seems to be move, moving much more smoothly now that they're using the QR code system once you're in line, those kinds of things. But they have to had to close early a couple of days this week just because of volume. That by two o'clock they had to stop the line so that they could make sure that they saw all of those people um, who were already in line. So in other words, come two o'clock, they had more people in line than they could see for the rest of the day. Yesterday, they did also close early, but that was more of a staffing issue as um, you know, we know that businesses uh, with this level of transmission, staffing is hard in every arena. We are continuing to request mobile units from the state and they have put a couple of extra units in circulation. So we are waiting on confirmation on one upcoming and we will share that as soon as we have confirmation about that clinic. The Indianapolis Motor Speedway has been extended through the 22nd of this month and the state has added some specific walk-in hours for those clinics. She explained that as the Omicron variant hits Monroe County, breakthrough infections, meaning positive COVID-19 cases among people who are vaccinated, are on the rise. However, she said cases were less severe and less likely to require hospitalization compared to someone who has not received the vaccine. So cases um, have been in fully vaccinated individuals, we talked about breakthrough cases, have increased significantly over the past month. Hospitalizations and death remain much lower than, than in those who are unvaccinated. In fact, breakthrough infections, while they do occur, uh, are only 3.7% of the people who are fully vaccinated are experiencing breakthrough infection. And of those people who do get infected, less than 1% is requiring hospitalization and more serious disease care. President of IU Health's South Central Region, Brian Shockney, said that COVID-19 hospitalizations were down last week despite record highs in positivity. On the other hand, this does not mean hospitalizations are not an area of prime concern, said Shockney. As Penny shared, our number of overall cases in the greater community is the highest we've seen pandemic to date, yet we are fortunate to see a slight decline in here in the South Central region in our inpatient numbers this last week. Our inpatient census still remains at its highest. Part of this is due to incredibly ill patients who they're in the hospital for long enough, but they no longer are considered active COVID based on on quarantine guidelines. So we either move them or they're taken out of that COVID-19 status, and but they still re require that inpatient care. Across the IU Health system, we are experiencing the largest COVID-19 inpatient census that we've seen since the beginning of the pandemic with an alarming increase of new admissions, as you can see on the screen. As our weekly infographic continues to show, this remains a fight of the unvaccinated, as here in the South Central Region, our COVID-19 inpatients are comprised of 80% of unvaccinated individuals and 90% of those in critical care or on a ventilator are unvaccinated. Nearly two years 
years into this pandemic, IU Health as a system, we are on track to experience a record amount of COVID-19 inpatient deaths this month, and quite, quite possibly the same as a state. As a state, over 19,319 individuals have passed away, which is 94% of those deaths that were individuals who were not fully vaccinated. Indiana hospitals have had over 108,782 individuals last checked on the website requiring hospitalization due to COVID since the pandemic began. Non-vaccinated individuals make up about 98% of those that have been hospitalized. And we're seeing that here in the South Central region. Chief Health Officer at Indiana University, Dr. Aaron Carroll, gave updates on IU's policies after making the decision to return to in-person classes. Well, as everyone has been saying, and I'm not going to belabor the point too much, this is a surge. Um, this is about as bad as we've seen it in terms of numbers, and I, I'd say that we're experiencing uh, a similar situation at IU, where the numbers are higher than we have seen before. Um, having said that, uh, they're about, well, in fact, they're probably a little bit lower than I, I think I might have even expected this week. Um, we are encouraging vaccination and booster, which is the best thing we can do, as many of others have said, in order to uh, you know, keep people both from getting ill and keeping this as contained as possible. Uh, we have drop-off testing on top of our symptomatic testing, on top of our voluntary testing on top of our COVID check testing. And so there's just an enormous capacity to uh, make sure that those who get tests um, can get them. We are uh, revised, we've revised our quarantine and isolation guidelines to, to more closely match those of the CDC. We are op, you know, optimizing all of our procedures to keep all that going. We have asked faculty not even to mask, unmask while they're lecturing to keep our classrooms as safe as possible. And as we've seen throughout the pandemic, our classrooms tend to be some of the safest places that we have on campus with very, 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 very few uh, documented transmissions that take place there. All of which is to say that we're doing our best to be as safe as possible while this surge is still going on. Um, we're optimistic that hopefully, as it is in many other places, the surge will start to decrease in the next hopefully week or two um, but regardless we will keep all of our safety measures in place and everything else that we're doing to, to try to keep indiana safe or keep iu as safe as possible which we hope also keeps bloomington and indiana as safe as possible as well to schedule an appointment for a vaccine or a booster shot please visit ourshot.in.gov for more information on testing sites visit coronavirus.in.gov and that is all for Cats Week. Thank you for joining us. For Cats and WFHB, I'm Annalise Poorman. Thank you.